Hey, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to season two of Pizza Talk. Uh, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, but we're also simultaneously on Martha's Vineyard with Nina Levin and uh, and her friend Georgia Macon, who are have throughout the summer been cranking out pizzas and hoagies and all sorts of things on the vineyard. Uh, so welcome to Pizza Talk. You are helping us launch season two, so thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. us. We're super excited. Yeah, we're great. Well, you know, we didn't know about you. There's a lot of people who are watching who maybe who've never been to the vineyard who don't know about you. But anyone who has been to the vineyard or was or spent the summer there clearly knows about you because I think uh, you guys became kind of the rage of the island. Everybody, when we interviewed uh, 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 Glenn Roberts and we talked to uh, um, Ed Levine, both of them who, who summer on the island. Uh, both of them independently brought up uh, with Stony, Stony, is it Stony Point? Stony. Oh. Stony. Okay. I'm sorry, Stony. I lost your sound. No worries. Stony Hill Pizza? With Stony an Hill. Stony. I used to live near Stony Point Road, so you're Stony Hill, Stony Hill Pizza. So they both brought it up and they said, you've got to talk to Nina. And we were going to talk to you, uh, you know, in season one, but then uh, you've been so busy and we ran out of time. So we said, let's take a break and we'll bring you back for season two, and now you're just coming to the end of your season, uh, yep. right? Our first season, so. And what happens after that? When you guys, uh, you know, like go on break, are you going to be staying on the island, leaving the island? Will you be still cooking or catering or anything? <laughs> well, I'm going to do a little bit of private cooking, but everything's so up in the air with COVID. So um, I think we'll just shut down the pizza trailer and then just kind of see what happens in the world <laughs> yeah. so yeah. play it by ear in other words yeah. you know, like the rest of us <laughs> like everybody else no pressure it's good yeah all right well that's good but it sounds like number one it sounds like you had a great season right you, you were busy you were you were putting out and it started with pizza but it suddenly it morphed into sandwiches and hoagies and other things that you were doing um so Nina, tell us a little bit about sort of how this all came about and and sort of the whole journey that you've been on yeah that yeah. brought you to, to this summer of COVID uh, on Martha's Vineyard? Um, so I uh, moved back to Martha's Vineyard, my hometown, um, like two years ago. And I really wanted to do something on the island that kind of hadn't been done before. Um, and I didn't want to open a restaurant. I wasn't ready for that. So I saw a little niche for pizza because there's really not a great pizza place on island. Um, yeah. There's places that are, you know, decent, but nothing like wood fired. Um, so I spent the winter building um, the trailer uh, from the axles up, as Georgia says, <laughs> um, and worked with a machinist and designed it and then built the oven. Um, and then just started in the spring, just really slowly kind of working out the kinks and everything. And then, yeah. But, but well, first of all, I got to ask, you grew up on Martha's Vineyard? I did. I yeah. didn't know that anybody did that. I thought people only just visited Martha's Vineyard. There are actually people that grew up on the yeah. island, and you're one of them. Uh, I know that that's, that I was kidding when I said that, because I had students when I when I taught at the Providence campus at Johnson & Wales who grew up on the island as well. But it's, uh, it's so few, you know, usually it's like, uh, it's like when I moved to, uh, to North Carolina, it was rare to find somebody who actually grew up in Charlotte. Everybody moved to Charlotte. And, uh, and so it's exciting to actually meet someone. What was it like growing up on the island? What was it, what, what was life like? Um, it was interesting. You want to, yeah, she's going to just hold some dough. Okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Georgia a little bit more in a bit, but uh, I know she's doing, she's kind of like your right hand today. So we're going to let her get to go. Um, it was uh, interesting. It was quite, it's small. It gets really small in the winter. So it goes from like 150,000 people to around 20,000. So it drops a lot, and um, I liked growing up here. It's like I can't really complain about it, but I did when I was a teenager. <laughs> That's that seems to be normal. Anyone who yeah. grew up on Nant Nantucket or on the vineyard, they they say I got to get off the island. <laughs> yeah, you have to go. I think everybody needs to leave for at least a little bit, and then kind of you can appreciate it more. You know the beauty of the island. So. Yeah, I, I left for about 10 years. I left when I was 17. Um, I went to culinary school and then came back a few years ago. I've done some summers off and on because I love working here in the summer, but yeah. Well, like uh, where did you go to culinary school? 
I went to New England Culinary in Montpelier, Vermont. Uh-huh. Yeah, how was that? Did you enjoy that? I love Vermont, so. Yeah, it's fabulous up there. And it's a great school. Um, uh, and of course, anyone who's been to Vermont, you know, loves Vermont. Uh, it's all in the news right now today. Uh, front page news about the state of Vermont is has been the most successful in dealing with uh, COVID as far as... Uh, yeah. They've got their, their act together up there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, well, wait, but so so a lot's happened between culinary school and this summer. Uh, you went on, you know, after culinary school, you must have gone on some kind of a culinary pilgrimage of your own. Um, so I did an internship in Boston at Les Folliers, which is now closed. They just closed last year. Really? Um, mm -hmm, or two years ago, maybe now. And um, that was an amazing experience. It was super fine dining. Kind of has gone out of style a little bit, I think. Um, and they they stopped when they were really on top, which was great to see. Um, and then I went to Portland, Maine, and worked at Hugo's and Eventide. Um, helped them open their new restaurant, Hugo's. They revamped the whole kitchen, uh, and went down to Peru and spent two months down there, basically just eating food, and it was amazing in Lima. And then um, did a summer on the island and then moved down to South Carolina in Charleston, uh, where there's just like, it's, there's so much good food down there. It was amazing. Well, um, you did two great foods. I mean, Portland, Maine is the Portland, Oregon of the East Coast. Basically, Port the two Portlands are two of my favorite food cities. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, and I know that a lot of exciting, innovative things have been happening up there. And you were in the middle of that. And then of yeah. course Charleston. Everybody loves Charleston when it comes to food and wine. It's the, it's it's phenomenal. So, it was, yeah. Who did you get to work with down there? Um. So I I kind of met Glenn Roberts down there and started working um, for him, uh, doing a recipe development and um. So I do their social media as well. Oh. Uh, so when you so you actually knew Glenn uh, off the island. Yeah. Um, so when so when he when he came when he comes up to the island, he already he already had a relationship with you. Uh, so and that's at Anson Mills, right? Yeah, Anson Mills. Um, I didn't know that he was on the island, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, and then so I worked at a place called Butcher and Bee, and then um, with Cynthia Wong, who's a James Beard nominated um, pastry chef. She's amazing she does incredible stuff she just started her own company called life raft treats and it's incredible um was and your then focus I, uh, in culinary and and beyond mostly on the baking and pastry side no I it until i moved to south carolina and then i worked um with a friend of mine in the bakery there and helped him open kind of that bread program um, and then I went over to work with Milani Durant, um, who is the pastry chef at Fig, but she opened her own little breakfast food truck on the beach and it was amazing. So I did that with her, helped her kind of set systems and all that. And that was probably, it's probably my favorite job I've ever had. It was it's, awesome. It's a good, uh, training for what you're doing with your own truck now, right? So exactly. yeah, mobile unit and, uh. So you were you were in the right place at the right time. It sounds like and ready. And it was it was a great experience. You know, there was always something going wrong. So that <laughs> <laughs> this whole summer. <laughs> so. What's that? That's I think a really good point. Let's talk about that. Like when something goes wrong, that's probably the best training anybody can get is is making it work when things aren't going perfect. Yeah, exactly. Like the track would break down, the generator would stop, we'd lose the power, we'd. Yeah, you name it, it happens. What, what kind of food were you doing, you know, on, on the Carolina beaches? Uh, what kind of what? What kind of cooking and food were you doing there? Oh, so we did, um, we made all our own bread and we did breakfast sandwich with sandwiches with like local eggs and everything we could get. But they were like, and then we would do pastries and drinks and coffee. Um, it was, it was really fun. It was like just so fun to make the menu and work yeah. with yeah, we did a lot of milk buns, Japanese milk buns um, that we do the breakfast on. Everybody's loving the those those milk breads and that. When you say Japanese milk buns, could you talk a little bit for because people have heard about this, but not everybody understands what the technique is that makes it the Japanese milk bun as opposed to 
sort of an American milk blend? Um, so it's a it's an enriched dough, um, but it's also made with a tanzong, which is basically like a slurry, flour and water slurry that you take to a certain temperature mm. and then add that into the dough once it's cooled. And it adds so much moisture. Um, and then the Japanese milk bread is a bit sweet on the sweeter side. Sweeter, and yeah. And then like caramel and when you brown it. Yeah. Totally addictive. I mean, you can't stop eating it. Uh, one of our restaurants here in Charlotte became famous for it, uh, Kindred. Joe Kindred uh, makes that every day, and everyone who sits down at the restaurant gets a little loaf of his, and they just call it milk bread, but uh, it came out later that he was using this Tangzong method, which is essentially, from what you're describing, you pre-gelatinize some of the starches that go into the final dough, which makes the dough softer and more spongy and it just does something it, it's magic right <laughs> it is it really is magic i love it i use it for burger buns now too it's such a great uh, yeah. now george is with you uh and uh george uh, was with you throughout the summer is, is she well, what's your role within the uh the the stony hill uh project that you've been doing blue she holds it all together but i'll let her talk about <laughs> her background so Georgia, are you from the island too originally? No, not at all. I'm actually from St. Louis, Missouri originally. Wow. Um, came here by just sort of a stroke of fate. So I'm from St. Louis and then I went to culinary school in France um, nice. at Cordon Bleu in Paris. I think we've heard of that place. It's It, <laughs> it, has, it, has, a, it has a reputation. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah so... Of course, Julia Child put it on our on our maps. Everybody already knew about it in France, but now yeah, you know. it was an idol for a long time. So I what was that experience like? Did they did they were they hard on you because you were in America? Oh yeah, it was pretty. I mean, it was incredible. But if you didn't, I didn't speak French very well when I came, and if you didn't speak French, the professors just would not even talk to you. Um, so you learn very quickly. Uh, wow. which is, um, but it was. Yeah, they're very, very rigid, very old school in their yeah. tech. Like we were making things that I don't think anybody's made in 150 years, but that's just sort of French for you, you know. Very sure. Traditional. Yeah. sure they're, they're very proud of their heritage, but also that, that foundation is, is great for being able to do some new, modern, innovative things as well. Yeah, exactly. The techniques that you learn and just the, yeah, the formulas. Um, it's, yeah, it's great. And we had to do every single thing by hand from like Italian meringues to brioche, which yeah. I would wish on my worst enemy, but <laughs> no. Did, you do all your lamination, like croissants and things by hand too? No, yeah. no machines, no cheaters. Later in my career wound up doing for a whole, for a whole season on the island. So it was something I never thought I was gonna have to do, but it turns out, turns out it was useful. Um, how, how did you end up uh, at Martha's Vineyard? So I was living, I had moved from San Francisco. I was at Tartine for a few years there. Um, Another one then, of our favorite places. <laughs> yeah, it's a good spot. I was at yeah. the original bakery on Guerrero and then I helped open up the first manufactory. Um, and now there's what, like 17 of them. Is that yeah. right? Are they really, they're really popular? I don't I mean, it's a lot. It's a pretty, it's an empire at this point. I think he's got two in LA, seven in the Bay Area, and then Well, well we, you, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, we, we actually filmed uh, an early uh, episode of Pizza Quest uh, at Tartine uh, with Eric Wolfinger, who was one of the bakers at the time. And in the background, Chad, Chad's shaping bread. We never could get him to kind of come and talk on camera at the time. This was 10 years ago. Uh, right. Before there was a manufacturing in any case, but uh, but uh, what what uh, Eric did was he took some of that the dough that they use for the for their famous uh, country French breads that's yeah. my favorite favorite loaf in the country uh, and he made pizza upstairs in his apartment where he lived above the bakery and he made yeah. pizza for us and it was a great episode so any of you guys who are watching right now just put uh, put tartine or put. Uh, 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 want to go back to our archives and look at some of the early episodes when we're on in the Mission District in San Francisco and you'll see what we're talking about as far as Tartine goes. But so that was a great place to do some some uh, sort of training and, and uh, build your resume and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I really cut my teeth in terms of um, I wasn't much of 
a bread baker up until that point. I loved it and I was fascinated by it, but I didn't really know much until spending time there. Um, so then I moved to New Zealand to open a bread bakery there, but then ran into some sticky, sticky visa troubles. Wow, that's a big leap over to New Zealand. Yeah, I figured um, I wanted I wanted to be far away at the time. San Francisco is a lovely city, but it can really grind you down after a while. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. What well, was New Zealand? Other really than the visa, I'm sorry, but other than the visa thing, what was New Zealand like? It's a beautiful country. Incredible. Yeah, really, really beautiful, really great people. I mean, not many people, which was sort of what I was going for at the time. <laughs> Great people and like a really blossoming culinary scene right now, which is really cool. Um, so you really have the ability. It's still building a lot, so you can really make your mark there if you've got something new and something you want to really offer to the community and they're really receptive to it. So it's, yeah, it's an incredible place. If you can, if you can get there, I recommend it. Well, I'd love to. I mean, travel right now is not so easy. I mean, it's, it's good that you were able to get back when you did. Yeah. What, so how did the two of you connect and, and start working together? So I wound up on the island just super randomly because I was leaving New Zealand with no real plan. Um, and I had a friend who was here, so I just popped on over. And then my somebody who worked for me, I was running a cafe here the last couple summers. My right-hand man is friends with Nina. So we got connected that way. Yeah. Hit it off, made a cake together last yeah, summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were married. And then it, the also, rest the yeah. it all started with the cake. Strong. Yeah. <laughs> the wedding cake. Yeah, it was great. One year strong. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah, there were quite a bit. So, so since then, you've, you, you ended up launching Stony Hill, which is mostly future. We're gonna, what we're going to do is in, in the next segment, we're going to see you guys make something, a few, maybe a couple of things. But I know that uh, because we're, we're, you're getting ready for the weekends, uh, you know, uh, I guess you'll be opening for your, your loyal following yeah, and you'll be doing pizzas again. But for today, one of the other popular items that you have been making have been the hoagies, right? The uh, sandwiches. And so you're going to show us how your, your, your take on a hoagie. I'm a Philly guy. So, you know, I have my own sort of passion for hoagies. Oh. And, and so we'll talk hoagies a little bit, but maybe a few other show some other things that you've been working on. So it's more than pizza, what you're doing. But the thing that we're and, and the thing I, I, before we break for segment two is uh, is the pizzas that, I, that I've seen on Instagram, your photos, uh, the, the word of mouth that's out about the pizzas is that they're phenomenal. And and when you look at the photos, you just want to eat them. And one of your probably one of the signature pizzas that everybody's raving about was your uh, corn and shiitake pizza. And that particular one is going to be in our Pizza Talk book. The book will be coming out next year. And we're calling the book Pizza Quest, My Never-Ending Search for the Perfect Pizza Continues. That's the name, the full title of the book. And we're featuring some of our favorite pizzas uh, from the people that we met. So we're getting one of yours in that book. In that book and um, and we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it later on. But um, uh, what else did you have in mind for, for our little show and tell section of the show? So, um, so this is our second to last market. So we're doing, we're still doing Sicilian style pizzas, which we're making right now. And George just put them into the pans. Um, and then we do, we like to do a dessert as well for every market. So we did a butternut squash and what would you call it? Butterscotch? butterscotch? Yeah, blondie. Uh-huh. That um, and then what else are we gonna do? Oh, we're gonna do a sausage hoagie on this bread that um, we use for the Sicilians, uh, but it's like a panda cristal hybrid, thing. Uh, almost like a focaccia. It looks like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then we'll do like a nice little snappy sausage with some onion jam and some other goodies. Fantastic. Well, I'm getting hungry just hearing about it. <laughs> so why don't we take a little bit of break? I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to set up. We'll come back in part two with Nina Levin, Georgia Macon, uh, Stony Hill. Is it Stony Hill Pizza or what do you, is that what you call the? But then sometimes we change it to Stony Hill Hoagies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it really should be just Stony Hill Empire, but uh, yeah. 
yeah. Still right now on Martha's Vineyard, but who knows? Martha's Vineyard today, the world tomorrow. All right, we'll be back in a couple of minutes with uh, with Nina and Georgia uh, and, and rejoin us on Pizza Talk. We're going to be talking and maybe tasting hoagies. See you in a minute. Welcome back. I'm Peter Reinhardt. I'm with Nina Levin, in, uh, who's in Martha's Vineyard in the commissary kitchen of Stony Hill Pizza, right? And you got some dough, it looks like, to your right, rising. What, do, what are you doing there? Um, so this is our Sicilian style dough. Um, it's a, like a hybrid of a pen de cristal. It's a 90% hydration. We use wow. um, Mills flour. So there's um, the red fife in there. And then um, the, what else do we use? Sir Galahad as well. Um, and there's a little bit of sugar, yeast, and olive oil. Uh, Can it's, yeah. Nina, could you explain what pan de cristal means for those who don't know that term? Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It's, it was like a search to find the recipe. A friend of mine um, gave me kind of his hybrid on the recipe. Um, but it's it's like a traditional Spanish dough. They use it with pan de co con tomate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a really, it's sweet. It's almost like focaccia. It's really, really light and fluffy. Um, Baked straight on our hearts. Traditionally. What did you say, Georgia? Baked straight I, on our traditionally. Yeah, yeah we, we hear Georgia telling us now, baked straight on the hearth instead of in a pan norm, uh, in the traditional form. But a wet yeah. dough like that's not easy to bake right on the hearth. Yeah, and it's, it's, this is like, it's so, um, this is really temperamental. It always gives us problems, but it gets to about like double, double this size. This is yeah, super. look at that. Wow. Um, yeah, you can see the, the crumb in there. So you can, you use it both for, uh, for like a Sicilian style pizza, but also for sandwiches. Yep. Yeah. We usually pop up the, uh, the weight in the pan for the hoagies and then just do smaller weight, a smaller amount for a Sicilian. It's got that great, um, open structure that yeah. I think that's kind of one of the signatures of, uh, you know, Ponte Cristal is that it's, it's known for those big holes. Yeah, and it's slightly sweet, and it gets that nice, kind of like the Japanese milk bread. It'll get that nice, um, crispy edges. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, okay, so so you've got that going. So I, I think what I just saw you do was to finish stretching it out into the into the pan. Yeah, About so we'll... You weigh that dough before you put it in the pan? The weight? Yeah, what's the weight? 1,800? 1,800, 1800 yeah. yeah. Per pan. 1,800 um, grams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these will uh, pretty much double in size once they're, like, they're um, proofed. And then we'll pop them in. And then we par-bake them. Um, and then put a blend of, we do a really classic tomato sauce. And then do a blend of sharp cheese on top. And then we'll do pepperoni as well. And then um, they come out in these chunks. Yeah. Wow. Um, and basically, it's about four pounds of dough when you to put it into a sort of our American uh, equivalencies. About four pounds of dough to give you that big thick. That's a. It's amazing how much it rises up because when I do four pounds of dough in a pan that size uh, of my dough, it only comes up about a, one inch. But you're getting like an inch and a half to two inches of rise. Yeah, nice heavy duty pans as well for like deep dish almost. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you do sell Sicilian pizza as well as uh, as uh, Neapolitan style. Yeah, we do the Sicilian style squares, um, individual ones at the market. Uh, they're probably my favorite thing that we make. Really, <laughs> and and do the customers respond that way too? Is it is it about yeah. uh, as much passion for those as for the Neapolitan? I don't know. Sometimes I think when we sell out of pizza, like the rounds, um, they're okay with getting the Sicilians. But, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. But some people come specifically for the Sicilians. Partly, it probably depends on where they grow up. You know, if they grew up in uh, in uh, Brooklyn somewhere, you know, they probably you know crave that Sicilian. Right, exactly, or Detroit. Yeah, or or more like a Detroit thickness. Yeah. So okay, so so those are rising now, uh, and 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 then you'll bake them off after they rise. Yeah, we're yep. gonna bake them off. We'll probably pop them in the proofer which is mm. just a oven. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and then we're going to make a, a hoagie really quick. We've got some of that same bread that I just cut in half here. Um, uh -huh. 
toast that. We've got a really yummy, spicy Italian snappy sausage, some Gruyere cheese, some Dijonese, which is aioli and Dijon mixed together. And nice. then we've got an onion jam, which I made with brown sugar and um, balsamic vinegar and red wine vinegar. Uh, it's one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah, I'm just, I want to melt this cheese on the sausage and pop it in the oven and then we'll make the hoagie. So, so you're gonna, uh, so you're, you're melting the cheese on the sausage, not on the bread. No, so, you, so you're gonna put the hot filling on top of a, a, a untoasted piece of bread. No, right. or the bread too, but I like it toasted on the, the sausage because I think it kind of like envelops it a little bit. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So you toast it all at the same time. But then well, it's just a reference. And that's a lot of steps. Like when you're doing, uh, you know, a line of people, you're doing some extra steps to give them that special. Yeah, oh, exactly. experience, yeah. So we'll do at the market. We take the the trailer there, even when we do hoagies. So we'll heat it up in the wood fired oven, um, and then do those all kind of uh, ahead of time and wrap them and then serve them. Serve them oh, I see. So they're already made up. Even even uh, so, the cheese is does it stay warm and stay melty and kind of stringy? Yeah. Or? Sausage kind of in the oven for as long as we can. We usually do them in rounds. So we'll do like. I don't know, 15 at a time. And then by the time that those sell out, we have another round coming. It usually sells <laughs> out by 10, by 10 o'clock and the market starts at nine. We so. doubled our bogeys last yeah. time. And yeah. it was like 10 minutes later. It was crazy. It's what happens when you, you create a monster, everybody wants it. And then, uh, and then you got, uh, you know, you got to figure out a way to keep them coming. Yeah, and then so the other hoagie that we'll do next Saturday is on um, a challah bread that Georgia makes. Um, really delicious big challah with Benny seeds from Anson Mills on top. Uh -huh. Yeah, we do Aleppo aioli, marinated artichokes, roasted red peppers, Casa Beltrano olives, uh, provolone, sliced tomato, shaved um, iceberg lettuce, and onion, shaved onion. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, and it's like a uh, vegetarian Italian, we call it. So it's amazing. It must be great for someone like Glenn Roberts uh, to see his Anson Mills flour being used on Martha's Vineyard in, in the sandwiches that you're making. Yeah, it's great. It adds such a depth of flavor. We also have the dough over here, the pizza dough, if you want to take a look. Um, so yeah. this is a blend of uh, Galahad and uh, the Red Fife as well. And this is all sourdough. So your so your pizza doughs are uh, always uh, naturally leavened and no yeast at all. Do you spike it with a little commercial yeast? No yeast at all. Naturally, no yeast at all. And is that is that true for the challah and the uh, and the pan de cristal? Pan de cristal is a blend of starter and yeast, uh -huh. um, so it adds a little bit of that sour flavor, but no blend for that. And then the challah is just straight yeast; and it's a straight dough. Okay. Okay. Good. So you so you're not uh, yeast averse. It's just that you just love working with the natural starter for the pizza dough. Yeah, I really like a challenge and never knowing what's gonna happen. But that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you talk about you know like things that can go wrong? Uh, have you had any kind of situations like that that you've had to troubleshoot? Yeah, we had a day that we just scratched the pizza in general uh, because it was just not moving and it was cold out. And it hadn't been cold for like a couple weeks, so we weren't prepared to, you know, up the Levon and the pizza dough. And yeah, I just called it. It was like we can't, we can't serve it. It's too flat. Well, like yeah. pita, pita bread. Yeah, right, right. No, I would never throw it out. It's just too precious. But you turn right. it into something else. All right. So now we've got the cheeses melted over the sausage. And did you say you make that sausage yourself, or do you buy it already made up? Um, I buy it already made up. Uh, I'm like a a sucker for a really, I would trashy Italian sausage, um, like a really traditional one. So this is uh, from our local Chronix market, which is a local grocery store. Um, and it's absolutely delicious. See, so that is, looks like the you're putting down the, yeah, the onion jams going on there. And that gets kind of softer because the bread is nice and toasted. Mm. Um, and then, so we did another meat, we did, we've done meatballs, we've done eggplant parmesan, what else have we done? Um, uh, straight Italian, straight cold Italian. cut Italian. Yep. Yeah. And 
Definitely people like the, the vegetarian Italian and the eggplant parm the most. Really? So, and the eggplant parm and the vegetarian are both vegetarian uh, sandwiches. So that, yeah. so that means there's a lot of, uh, lot of support for vegetarian, for plant-based yeah. uh, foods. Yes. Um, so you can see the sausage is all covered in the cheese. Oh, oh God. It looks like, like a killer, like Philly cheesesteak. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like a nice, funky Gruyere. Oh. I'm loving it. I know. You can't taste it. We'll just have to tell you what it is. You, yeah, I know. We're going to have to live through you right now. But uh, that, that aioli, that was the garlic aioli that you put on? Is that what? <laughs> An aioli, but we mixed uh, uh, Dijon. Dijon, that's right. Dijon. Yeah. yeah, so. So. You just give it a little traditional wrap here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when, if, if you were making that, you know, at the market, what would that sandwich sell for it. Uh, well we've got, we've never made this one before but thinking 13 to 15. uh-huh big big worth, uh, yeah. yeah worth every penny well it's <laughs> not it's not just a sandwich or a hoagie it's it's made it's made with your homemade bread you know which they're not going to see anywhere else it's made with some heirloom grains and flowers it's made with you know uh, a lot of extra technique with the oven and the and the jam uh, well, we just say it's the it's onion jam. That takes time to make onion that onion jam. It's I make it all the time, and and I love making it. But it doesn't. It, it takes about an hour to put together a batch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good one, and we might throw green apples on it. We're still in Ooh. the yeah yeah. So there it is. That's so, little well, 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 since you've got that wonderful sandwich, so feel free to take a bite, and we'll eat along with you if you want to. I'll leave it you know, to you. <laughs> So I, I have no problem if you want to uh, talk with your mouth full because I do it all the time. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I do want to ask, and Georgia, you can chime in on this too. You know, in terms of constructing a sandwich, I think the art of sandwich making is just like the art of pizza making. You know, it's all about the layer, layering of flavors. Do you have kind of like a, a thought process or a philosophy that you follow in, in, in creating these kinds of foods? You go. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I don't know. I think we just, I feel like we work really well together. And when one of us has like an idea, we kind of just build on that. Like if, if we want to use butternut, we just kind of build off of that and play around with flavors mm -hmm. and ideas. And We're good at rattling off. Like if we just have one launching off point, we both have like a laundry list of things mm -hmm. that we like to eat with that thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because since we both have a fine dining background, we do build them a lot like dishes, you know? Yeah, yeah. Find that balance and acidity, creaminess, salts, yeah, et cetera. Components. Yeah, right, all those different components. And, and in fact, when you mentioned uh, putting some sliced like green apple or something like that on there, it, it, it made sense to me immediately <laughs> because uh, you've got you've got the, the umami and you've got the cheese and you've got a lot of soft textures, but but nothing crunchy and in, in a... In a, an Italian hoagie, you get the onions and the lettuce and all this crunch factor. And the apples, I think, would be, it sounds like it would be the perfect complement to add that missing uh, dimension. Yeah. Definitely. But George is going to cut um, what I'm most excited about in this whole world. Um, <laughs> she's going to cut these blondies that we just made with um, butternut squash puree and wow. little butter scotch shards wow. um yeah we use a little bit of rye flour in there too just for some flavor so it's a butter nut butter scotch blondie <laughs> so you got but the, the <laughs> butter butter is the operative word here there must be some butter in there as well right yeah it's, it's a a bit significantly bit. buttery blondie yeah wow a, 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 a blondie. so is this something that you've just created is this a new product for you yeah, yeah, we just came up with it like an hour and a half ago. Oh, so you're going to be tasting it for the first time right now? <laughs> yeah, we love that. So yeah, we'll switch around and, and help she'll do that. Sure. Talk about it a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the blondie itself, as Nina said, we use brown sugar and rye flour just for a little more nuance and depth like deep sweetness uh -huh. because blondies can be sort of like saccharine you know yeah um, 
But and then the blondies are really having kind of a their their moment again. It's like brownies are always popular, but blondies they come back in waves, and all of a sudden, they they totally. cravings for blondies. Totally, yeah. I'm a huge blondie person, and the really cool technique for the top here, you see this like little giraffe pattern almost. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you do that? You basically make a hard caramel. Um, and then tip it out on the silly pads and push it out until it's this paper thin layer of glass, as some people call it. Uh -huh. And then once it's cooled, you can break it up and put it over the batter. And as it cooks, it'll sort of melt into it and soften it. Oh. Um, just give you this really nice, yeah, butterscotchy, butterscotchy finish. So it's pretty <laughs> delicious. Yeah, that's a great technique. Uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't have thought of that. That you can take some hard, basically hard caramel, uh, mm -hmm. put it back on the batter, and it, and then it would soften a little bit. Does it reharden when the when the blondie cools? No, because it's already take, taken up so much of that moisture from the blondie. Uh -huh. um, and as the blondie cools, it's actually gonna sort of release a little bit more moisture, so it'll continue to soften a little bit. Like it might be a little bit too some right now, but yeah, it should just sort of melt into its surroundings. Wow, that's a great idea. So yeah, yeah, I love that, that you're taking some of this, uh, you know, the classical techniques that you've learned and 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 things that you've picked up, you know, along the way, whether it's at Tartine or some of the restaurants that you all work at. Uh, mm -hmm. When you were in New Zealand, did you pick up any tricks down there that you could, were able to bring back that you hadn't seen before? Um. Or was it mostly about ingredients down there? Yeah, mostly ingredients. I did see, I saw a mill down there, a flour mill um, mm. that even Dad hadn't heard of yet, which was pretty crazy and it's wildly popular now, but uh, it's called a Demeter mill. Huh. <laughs> yeah. And it's got this technique that basically allows to mill the grain incredibly slowly um, over like a really controlled cool amount of time and so you wind up with this product that's just so so fine and super full of flavor um, wow uh, yeah i learned about new new things happening but yeah yeah no new tricks that come to mind do we have a fish bite somewhere um or, okay. yeah you can use that one um we my favorite thing georgia will you talk about the italian cream soda please yeah <laughs> favorite thing in the whole world I don't even I'm like I get excited about not pizza now because we've made it right <laughs> you're right now you now you've moved on now into into uh, blondies and and did you say cream soda yeah oh my god so yeah. uh, would you do me a favor and just get do a real close-up on that uh, on that yeah. blondie I look like zoom in on that uh, yeah. well so there you go <laughs> Um, and and it's made with some rye flour, but not exclusively rye, right? Is it is it uh, also uh, red flour or? or uh, yeah, or it's just about uh, twenty percent rye flour. Uh -huh. So that's another thing that's hot right now. Rye is back mm -hmm. in a big way. So you got yeah. the blondies and rye, and you're bringing a, kind of a couple different trends into one dish. Uh, how's it taste? What do you think? Are you there? I think it's delicious. So, you, so so the the theory is proving itself out in fact and. Will these be uh, available yeah. then to your, when you open uh, tomorrow, or is it today or tomorrow that you'll be opening back up for tomorrow. the, tomorrow? 10 a.m. Which is nice, because that caramel <laughs> will have time to soften a bit. And we took it really dark, uh, which is what Nina and I both like to do when it comes to caramel. Um, and I think a lot of things, like one shade <laughs> below burnt is sort of <laughs> my favorite flavor. Well, yeah, I always tell my students that uh, when they're talking about their bread and they want to pull out the bread too early, I say, if it's not burnt, it's not done. Exactly. Right, we call it Tartine Dark in San Francisco. Tartine Dark, yeah, exactly. So that's great. So you've got, so you've now come up with a new product to, to sell, uh, uh, butterscotch butternut. And of course, this time of year, butternut squash is, is the perfect ingredient to use. So uh, seasonal, it's not something you're going to make in the middle of the summer, right? Nope. No, no, we like to kind of go with the seasons here. There's some really great farms that we use products from. So, yeah. Well, yeah. things during the winter, if you get bored, you can just, you know, open up a Blondie's uh, station, yeah. you know, at the market and just keep <laughs> cranking Blondies. out pastries. Yeah, you know, you're going to use winter squash throughout the, you know, throughout the, the, the whole winter season. But 
Well, yeah. well, that's that's excellent. Thank you. So I can't wait to try that. It's funny because just in uh, I think it was in the latest issue of um, uh, People magazine, there was a blondie's recipe, and I can't remember really? whose recipe it was, but I don't know if you saw it, but it's a brown butter uh, blondie, uh, which I thought was a that. great technique. Yeah. Yeah, almost. Maybe next time. <laughs> just one more little tweak, you know, to throw into huh. the just to make it even more difficult to make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, We're this so has been fabulous. Um, is there any of that hoagie left that you made? Yes. Did, and uh, can can you hold that up again? We we got to see it in the wrapper, but let's get a really good close up. And as we kind of wrap things up today, uh, I'd love to leave yeah leave everybody with kind of like the lingering memory of a, of a sausage uh, hoagie uh, <laughs> that they're not going to get to eat unless they're on Martha's Vineyard uh, or they make it themselves. But you'll be posting all this on Instagram, right? You like you put a lot of photos up on Instagram so people can yeah. see them there. <laughs> And um, and uh, I don't know if you share any of those techniques, you know. But when, once you see it, then everybody's going to want to make it. So, so uh, what do you think? Is it, is it does it taste as good as it looks? It tastes as good as it looks. I think the the green apple would be great on there. <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, or or even some Vidalia, you know, like fresh Vidalia. Yeah, onions. Yeah. Ooh. Shaved onion. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just again, I uh, well, you know, I just. I think sandwiches are an art form that again will never go away they're going to be between pizza and sandwiches that's like what most people eat and um uh this we take them for granted we you know because we all everyone eats whether even a burger which people some people say is not a sandwich but i think it's, it's again a type of thing. but there's a reason why these things are so popular and it's because they deliver so much flavor uh and a lot of that flavor delivery is all about the contrast that are going on there texturally and and ingredient was so uh it looks like you guys have really zeroed in on and have a an amazing thing going on the island uh i i hope you get a chance during the the winter season to uh recharge your battery so you can come back even stronger in the in the spring and and see where this all leads do you have any any sense of a of a a, a plan or a vision or a hope for where you'd like to see it go nope any plans to, any plans to do pop-ups off the island um There you go. I don't <laughs> Got know. You'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Something, we'll something see. to think about during the during the winter around a, high, a, a nice fire. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Nina, Georgia, thank you so much for being with us Hi. today on Pizza Talk. Thanks for sharing some of your great food and uh, and inspiration. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, putting uh, your pizza, your corn and shiitake pizza, uh, in the, in the upcoming book. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. I'll keep uh, all our viewers posted as the progress of the book comes along. I'm writing it right now as we speak. Uh, and in fact, you know, I'm working on some of the new pizza recipes that are going into the book. There will be 35 pizzas that were either mentioned or featured on Pizza Talk or were part from somebody who we uh, had on Pizza Talk. And so there's going to be some uh, wonderful, inspirational uh, photos. You're going to actually send us photos of your own pizza each each. Each uh, creator of their pizza will send us uh, beauty shots of the pizza that will go in the book. So we're really excited about that. And we're so glad to have you be a part of that. And I can't wait to get, get to, the, to the vineyard myself. And uh, <laughs> yeah. for my first stop, you know, will be uh, right in your, your, your truck. Do you have, is it a market, a particular market where you guys uh, hang out? Yeah, we were doing the West Tisbury Farmer's Market, um, which is at the Agricultural Fa uh, Society Fairgrounds. Um, so it's outdoors. It's a great location up in West Tisbury. Fantastic. So anyone who wants to follow uh, Stony, it's Stony Hill Pizza on Instagram, right? So it's like, what is it? Is it a hashtag or do you have to do? I don't even know how you do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll find it. <laughs> just put just in the search, go Stony Hill Pizza and you, you, can, you can continue to follow the journey. Uh, thank you again for being part of uh, Pizza Talk. We'll see all of you on the next episode of Pizza Talk, and we'll see you on Martha's Vineyard. Thanks again for being with us. Nina Levin, Georgia Macon. Have a great day. Great market tomorrow. <laughs>